So, in your opinion, which patients would benefit from continuous EMG? Well, uh, I've argued that everybody in an intensive care unit with altered mental status is at risk of non-convulsive seizures and should get at least some EEG monitoring. Because um, it turns out that there's really no subgroup of critically ill patients with altered mental status that don't have at least an 8 to 10 percent chance of non-convulsive seizures. Uh, so we know that certain groups are much higher risk, the people who've had clinical seizures before, people with a, acute brain injuries. Um, so they're even higher risk. They're up at 30, 40 percent risk of non-convulsive seizures. But even those without have somewhere around 8 to 10 percent risk. So I've monitored if we can get the resources that all of them should be monitored. And uh, how long should a patient be monitored? What determines the duration of the monitoring? Our general screen for patients that are not comatose is 24 hours or close to that. As we know, if you, if you do one hour, you'll pick up about half of patients who are going to have a non-convulsive seizure at some point, but you'll miss the other half. If you do 24 hours, you'll get closer to about 90% of them. Now, it turns out if you're comatose, it's a little lower. You'll only get to about 80% after 24 hours. Uh, so for comatose patients, we like to do at least 48 hours. Um, the other patients who are at risk of later seizures or will do more than 24 hours are those with periodic discharges on their EEG or someone where you're withdrawing from uh, something that might be controlling their seizures, like a midazolam drip, something like that. So those people will do longer. So 24 hours for non-comatose patients and 48 hours for comatose. And um, can continuous monitoring pick up events in the patient which are not in, uh, of epileptic nature, but they can st still have an impact right. on patient's health? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. So, yes, uh, EEG monitoring can pick up things that are not epilepsy, and there, I guess there's two real areas with that. One of them is that it'll often discover that spells that people thought were epilepsy turn out not to be. So they're just posturing or tremors or uh, even peripheral reflex clonus can mimic seizures. And so we see a lot of spells that uh, I've called ICU pseudo seizures, where they look like seizures, but it turns out they're not. So that's one nice use of the continuous EEG monitoring is you can stop drugs in those people. Um, the, the other thing is we can detect things such as ischemia, and it's been shown most clearly in the subarachnoid hemorrhage vasospasm world, uh -huh. where quantitative EEG can detect ischemia uh, fairly well and usually well before any other modality because the patient's exams are quite limited. Transcranial Dopplers, it's, it's usually later and that's only intermittent. Um, and any kind of imaging modality, obviously you can't do it continuously. So continuous EEG monitoring can pick up ischemia quite early. It is somewhat labor intensive and uh, there are some issues with dealing with artifacts, but the software is getting better and better at not only identify an artifact, but even now there's some packages that will remove muscle artifact and blink artifact to enable you to do quantitative EEG right through all of that. Okay. So it's somewhat early and there aren't that many places that are routinely doing it, but it's been shown in multiple studies that EEG can detect ischemia well before any other modality can. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the future. Okay. And I understand you are a big proponent of uh, continuous EEG. But are there any potential downside to continuous EEG? So are there downsides to EEG? Well, yes, I'll tell you some of the arguments against it. Um, well, one is that there's no proof that, that it improves long-term outcomes. And the truth is nobody's looked. There's never been a prospective randomized trial to compare people who get monitored to those who weren't, or to ignoring non-convulsive seizures versus treating them. And we probably won't have a trial like that for a variety of reasons. So there is no class one proof that monitoring improves outcomes. Mm -hmm. However, there's extensive data doing retrospective multivariate analyses that non-convulsive seizures are independent predictors of worse outcome, um, including functional outcome, neurologic status, later epilepsy, hippocampal size on MRIs later, um, increased mass effect on serial CAT scans after intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, if you do microdialysis, you see very high brain glutamate levels after okay. non-convulsive seizures. So there's a variety of adverse physiologic events associated with them 
and a variety of outcomes that have been associated in retrospective studies. So it, it certainly looks like nonconvulsive seizures are adding to uh, the neurologic burden or the injury and that it's better off treating them. Um, on the other hand, people have argued, well, they're overtreated. People who get treated aggressively actually do worse. And it's certainly possible that some people are, are overreacting and overtreating the seizures. And there's certainly uh, plenty of room for judgment and debate on how aggressively to treat nonconvulsive seizures. So that the jury is still out on, on that one, exactly how aggressively. Um, people have also said it costs too much, that there's at least one article out there. The first author was uh, Nye, N-E-Y, um, that looked at the giant inpatient hospital database and looked at everyone who got urgent EEG and, ha and was intubated. And they compared those who had a routine EEG to those who had continuous EEG monitoring and found that um, the mortality was lower in those who had continuous EEG monitoring and the cost and length of stay were really the same. So they concluded that the continuous EEG monitoring led to better outcomes without any increase in cost. So that's the best we have for that. The American Clinical Neurophysiology Society and the uh, Critical Care EEG Research Monitoring Consortium, uh, they both worked on getting this standardized nomenclature, which is now an ACNS guideline, so that everybody will objectively read uh, EEGs in critically ill patients the same and describe periodic patterns and periodic discharges and rhythmic patterns in the same way. So it's a very standardized, accepted uh, way to describe them all now. Now in the end, and whether you call them seizures or not, is still there's still some subjective component. Um, the nomenclature has gone through three rounds of interrater agreements and been published. And for the main terms, and uh, it looks like it's quite good with uh, very high agreement levels. But for some of these other descriptors, it's not quite perfect. But as far as describing 21 waveforms that are moving over time and doing it in English words, I think it's about as good as we're ever going to get. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.